Jeff Nippert, the YouTube fitness star, just funded a scientific study comparing full range of motion reps with lengthened partial reps for muscle growth. Although the results of this study are fascinating, it's not the topic of this video. If you're curious, go check out Jeff's latest video. It is an absolute masterclass in storytelling as well as science communication. But here I want to tackle something much bigger. What if social media can change the whole academic system? Imagine scientists being able to fund and also publish their research through platforms like YouTube. In this video, I will show you that this is actually already happening and why I think it might be a paradigm shift in science. All right, let's get into it. Hi everyone, I'm Gomar. I'm a senior scientist at ETH Zurich, based in Switzerland. And for the last decade or so, I have been entrenched in this whole academic system. I've been obviously a scientist myself, teaching different courses, tutoring students and publishing dozens of scientific papers. So I know a thing or two on how science is conducted. Usually it starts with an ID. An ID coming from the professor, the principal uh, investigator, or also in collaboration with one of his students. And that ID is nice, but obviously if you want to do a study, you need funding. And most of the time, that funding is coming from the government or governmental organizations where the professor, in collaboration with his students, writes a whole grant, writes down his idea and how they are going to do the experiments to try to solve the hypothesis or solve the question. Uh, and then this grant is, let's say, reviewed by external experts, usually peers, also researchers, so not coaches or uh, trainers or athletes, rather scientific peers. And then you have to get lucky that they like your ID and that uh, the funding is secured and you can go on with your whole project that usually lasts two, three, four years when it is a PhD product project. So that's one option. That's a more conventional way that most of the money or most of the funding is coming from the government. But then you also have the industry. Sometimes uh, some research projects are funded by the industry, right? The dreaded industry, which could be the pharma industry, but also supplement companies that want to know if one of their their product is good, is valid, and can actually improve whatever muscle mass, then they can also ask research labs to investigate their product. Obviously, this type of funding receives always a little bit more a critic because uh, there's always some kind of conflict of interest when the money that is used to do all the experiments is coming from the company that actually wants to sell the product. But interestingly enough, there is maybe now a third pillar of funding that is coming up more and more in research. And that could be through social media. Let me explain you the quick case of Jeff Nippert. Jeff Nippert is a fitness influencer, or I don't know how you want to call him. At least he has millions of followers on YouTube. It makes uh, exceptionally good videos, in my opinion, science-based videos on muscle building, power lifting, and so on. So how to gain muscle mass as a man, as a woman. And he does this for uh, several years now. So he obviously generates a lot of revenue, also has his own app. And obviously also with AdSense, he makes uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars per year. So for Jeff Nippert, the currency he works in is attention, right? The longer people watch his videos and the easier they click on the video, the title and the thumbnail, the better it is for his brand. And that's very important to understand. So the better content he provides, it's kind of the free market of content YouTube, the better his brand will be and the more revenue he makes. So he knows this, obviously, right? He's already long in the game. So I think he did something extremely clever. Because he's so science-based, he always trains via science, the latest scientific advancements. He wants to also have some kind of foot in the door into this science. So what he did, he funded... I don't know how much, but a large part of a scientific study that has been done in the lab of Brad Schoenfeld, who is a very renowned uh, scientist in the muscle building field. Like many people know him from Instagram also, he's quite well in science communication. So he has a good lab and he funded a large part of a study investigating the effects, not so important here, uh, of full range of motion reps compared to lengthened partials. What would be the best? Because some research in novice 
lifters said that if you train the muscle in a lengthened phase, that there's actually more muscle building compared to doing full range of motions. So you can think that, yeah, okay, it's nice, but this also is inherent to bias, this kind of research. And I agree. But to Jeff's credit, actually, the results of this study were not in favor of his whole brand because he always said that you have to train or the best way to train is this in this lengthened state and other people said that was not really true but at least he said it and then the study in more advanced lifters that he funded showed that there was no difference between range, full range of motion or lengthened partials again go watch the video it's a great video to see how this uh, evidence is communicated so now scientists or the scientific field can actually tap into the strengths of social media let me explain because social media when i started youtube a couple months ago i quickly started to realize that ids IDs where you talk about, like what you're talking about in your videos is the most important thing. Not your editing skills or not how you come on, on onto the camera or how you phrase certain things. It's rather what you are talking about. Is this interesting for people, right? And that's the whole, I think, problem now with science. If you look at sports science, I'm talking mostly about sports science because obviously that's uh, the scientific uh, realm I know the most of. I see the most, the, the most relevant and interesting papers were 10 or 15 years ago. The IDs in sports science are kind of going down, in my opinion, right? They're not that groundbreaking or relevant anymore. And that is because what I just said about the principal investigators. There, it is a, a top-down approach. The principal investigator or the professor thinks this is an interesting ID and he secures funding coming from experts that review his stuff, which are also scientists. Right? But what if you can use social media to have more a bottom-up approach where you can ask trainers, coaches and relevant people in the field where you do the sports science for, where you do all the studies on carbohydrates and exercise performance or how you build muscle or which supplements are the best. You don't do it for your peers as a researcher, right? Like, I don't care. I do it for athletes to make them better or coaches to have better coaching platforms. And you can use, you can leverage social media to get those ideas off the ground. So a good example is what we are doing now with what science, in my opinion. We just started Project Zone 2. I mean, there has been a lot of chatter about zone two, how it works, what we can do about it. Is it actually beneficial for exercise performance and so on? These ideas are coming, let's say, from social media. People find this interesting, right? That's also why more content creators are making content about zone two, because people think about this stuff, like people who train, people who run, people who even who do CrossFit. And what we did was simply do such a study, put it out there that we will do a study investigating traditional CrossFit style training and on top of that zone two. And in two weeks, we have 410 participants. So a lot of people who actually want to do this project, this uh, study, and hopefully we will get a cool results out of this. And again, this is leveraging social media. This is impossible to do this if you don't have any social media and you're just going to try to recruit random people. You will never get to those numbers and you will never get whatever 200 people per group. And this obviously makes research, in my opinion, much better. So it's clear that you can use social media to have a pool of better research ideas, but also you can leverage the eyeballs or at least the influences or of these big YouTubers to get some of your relevant research funded as a researcher. So I think this is something important and something not to forget. And obviously I know what you're thinking. Not everything is rainbows and sunshine on social media. Certainly not. You have the good guys or at least the ethical guys. That's maybe a better phrasing of them. Like uh, Jeff Nippert, Jeremy Etier, definitely also D Dr. Mike Israetel, who use 
some of their money to invest back into science or scientific studies. And that's kind of how Mr. Beast is doing this for years already, right? He makes a lot of money and then invests this money back into his videos, which is super cool. But what I, what I have to say <laughs> and, and what I really dislike about this type of uh, influences, like for example, Mr. Beast, is that he also sells candy to his millions of uh, followers, which are usually kids still or 14 year old kids when uh, child obesity is skyrocketing. So that's the, the less ethical part of social media clearly. So I was I was wondering what, what you think think about this for the for the first time in the, the industry, right? In history of the, the fitness influencer history, you have passionate, I think ethical, good and also very popular influencers who invest some of their money back into scientific studies and try to drive the field forward by making or generating better scientific studies based on better ideas. Let me know what you think about this in the comments and see you in the next video.